so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk through what I consider to be a blueprint for trading success and I don't mean that I'm going to go through my entire strategy and tell you where to get in and where to place your stop and and where to put your target and all the rest of it I mean I'm going to talk about the business in general and what I believe to be some of the most important things to consider and so what you can see in front of you is what should be your strategic goals as a trader firstly to conserve capital obviously you have to think about conserving capital before you can think about building and growing as a trader because you have no ability to produce a return if you do not have capital to trade with so conservation is absolutely key only once you understand that conserving capital is key can you think about generating an income and then as your account grows and you're generating an income then you're thinking about increasing your account size so there are several things that I believe are at the core of this business and we'll go through them now in turn and then if there's any questions at the end I can take them then um, these are not necessarily in the order of importance but they're things that you do need to think very carefully about the first one is capital controls so first and foremost rule only store a small percentage of capital with your broker or with your firm okay it's a vital importance that you adhere to that rule I only keep 10% of my entire net worth with my broker so what you should do is work out how much money you are prepared to trade with that is your trading pot keep 90% of it in a savings account that pays interest then keep 10% of it with your broker and trade with that obviously since we're all trading on margin you do not need to have a hundred percent of your account with the broker it makes me sick to see that people have got huge amounts of money with some brokers that literally could be here today and gone tomorrow you think not some brokers have got reputable names I've seen long-standing reputable brokers that have gone under it happens we come on next to the tools now I'm sure if you guys are trading you've all got tools to trade with but I'm still surprised by how a lot of people that should know better are still using shoddy tools um, for God's sake use a decent broker and do not put up with poor execution okay do not put up with repeated slippage this is how some brokers compensate for tight spreads you know they offer you tight spreads and then they fuck you slipping you constantly on trades I do understand that slippage is natural and that you are going to experience it from time to time but I've had brokers where literally virtually every single trade you get in no matter what size in a slow moving market they'll slip you a tick um, just be wary of it if you constantly find that you're getting slipped on the majority of your trades ditch that broker as fast as possible at the same time don't put up with spreads that are wide enough to drive a bus through um, now I know that spreads can widen um, at times of low liquidity like uh, sometimes uh, as we come into a piece of key event risk but I use a broker TD direct where they manage to keep a fixed spread um, Sunday night at 10 p.m. have a fixed one pip spread that is an edge in and of itself you know again I I'm surprised by people showing screenshots of their broker on a Sunday night and they've got like a 30 pip spread in some pairs it's absolutely ridiculous you have to bear in mind as well that variable spreads which again is somewhat natural can give a shoddy broker a license to absolutely kill you so get yourself a reputable broker and if you start to feel that there are games being played then find another broker ASAP is what I would say there when it comes down to charting again I know a lot of people use MT4 and MT4 is good I think for spot forex even for individual stocks if you're trading it do not use it for futures um, I do not know a broker that provides charting with MT4 that will back adjust their futures charts at rollover and you will find that most professionals will use a back adjusted chart 
Um, so again, if you're using an MT4 chart and charting something like crude oil, there's almost zero chance that you're looking at the same chart as a professional. And you know, if that worries you, well, it should do. So again, I wouldn't touch MT4 with a barge pole when it comes to futures, unless you're day trading and you're charting um, the market post roll, but you can't lean on the levels pre roll because they're not going to be accurate. Uh, have a decent news service. Still very, very surprised by the amount of people that do not understand when key news is coming out on a given day. Now, don't get me wrong, I know a lot of people aren't interested in the news. They want to trade the price action. They're not really bothered what the news is. But it is still very important to know when there is going to be news, at what time volatility is going to pick up. And you'd be surprised how many people have no idea whether there's news coming out and at what time and at what markets might be affected. So, you know, again, a decent news service with a comprehensive calendar. Um, I do from time to time actually trade the news. And I don't mean news as in, you know, the payrolls is a better or worse figure and I'll take a position. But I mean, I get an idea of how the market's moving. So if there's been good news, is the market moving up on good news? If the market's struggling to move higher on good news. That's a very important sign. Um, at the same time as that, you can get a very, very effective trade off the back of rumours. Um, I won't give you an example of this in a chart, but I'll tell you that if the market makes a sharp move and you find out that there is a rumour behind it, and that rumour is then negated, the vast majority of the time we're going to go right back to where the market was just before the rumour was released. And there's a very nice trade that you can do off the back of that, but you're going to have no idea of what is moving the market if you don't have a good news service. So I personally think a good news service will pay for itself. Um, but you should have a calendar at a very minimum. Also have a journal to record trades. And I'm a big fan of journaling. I really think it's an important part of my edge. I use Edgewonk. I'm sure everyone knows that by now because I've gone on about it so many times. But... I know not everyone likes journaling. I would say get to like it, but at an absolute minimum, you should keep a notepad uh, with personal observations of the types of situations you're encountering on a trading day um, and how they might be affecting you. So I often show this in webinars, which I think is an invaluable tool and it's called the Demon Finder. And basically what you're having down the left hand side is a myriad of different issues that traders face like they might be exiting their positions too soon they might be entering their positions too late chasing the market they might be trading too large or they might have a planned trade and not take it and basically I usually give this to students and say to them every time you make a mistake list it down here and write down the kinds of common mistakes that traders make and every time you make one of those mistakes tick it off okay so if you find you exited too soon put a tick there the next day maybe you get up you take a trade oh wow I've exited too soon again and we've gone on to hit target and you'll get to quickly see where you're having problems it's much easier when you have something visually in front of you than just trying to remember how many times it's happened to you um, I was speaking to someone today that said oh I think I'm getting out of trades too early I think what fucking use is I think you know, are you getting out of trades too early? Let's see the proof that you're getting out too early. Where was your original target? Where was your exit? How early did you get out? And has that been something that maybe hasn't been working for you for a couple of trades, but works for you in the long run, you know, to actively managing a trade? You've got to consider these kinds of things. But because a lot of people, you know, just can't be asked writing it down or journaling it, they're just at the mercy of their short term memory, which, you know, again, I, I think is a big problem. A lot of people make all kinds of mistakes and that demon finder won't list them all but if you find yourself making mistakes then you know make sure that you are aware of them I produce a lot of material like this that you'll see on the screen that I like to tweet out but these are typical trading mistakes that people make on a daily basis um, and they are amusing um, but when it happens once and then it happens twice, then it happens three and four, five, six times, then you're banging your head against a brick wall and you're never going to get anywhere if you keep 
making these same mistakes. I held a periscope on this recently with kind of what I consider to be the top trading mistakes. But, you know, this is a classic that I see a lot of people do. So they have a level that they plan to sell um, and they miss it. And of course, the market maybe turns just before that level, moves away from it and they have FOMOs, this massive fear that they're going to miss the big move that they're waiting for. And as it starts to back away from this area, they're thinking, fuck me, should I pay down? And they don't know what to do because they don't have a plan. So they're at the mercy of the market, which then advertises lower, smashes through a prior swing low, and they think, shit, this is really going to dump. I'll sell it here. They come in and sell the low. It ramps right back up to the level, breaks the prior swing high. They obviously puke the trade thinking, fuck me, it, you know, there's no follow through to the downside. It's breaking back above a swing high. I've got to get out. They buy it back and cover their short right where they should have originally been short and then see the market shit itself. And it is humorous, but I see people do this time and time again. Um, FOMO has a hell of a lot to answer for. Uh, this is a classic one. Um, again, I've tweeted a long time ago, but you get a sharp move to the downside and it just doesn't offer a pullback. I see this actually quite a lot in Bunds. You need the patience of a saint in the Bund. Look at today when it finally got going, this Bund. It just fucking goes parabolic out of the blue. There's no pullback, no pullback at all. You've got to be patient. You're going to have to wait. If it doesn't pull back, then you've got no trade. But you see what happens here in this example is we get this sharp downtrend and you know the traders sitting here thinking oh boy this is weak pull back come on give me a pull back jesus is really tanking you know any minute now it's going to pull back no it's not fuck it i'm all in at the low and usually again it will advertise by breaking a prior swing low it will advertise with a large range momentum candle possibly just post news and you'll come in and you'll you'll sell the low and see it finally make the pullback that you're waiting for so if you're making those kinds of mistakes, note them down, be aware of them. One thing I would say is when it comes to mistakes, you have to make sure that you're doing something about them. If I had a penny for every time I've heard somebody tell me what their problem is and what mistakes they're making, I would be pretty well off. But I tell you what, if I had a penny for every time somebody has told me the mistakes they're making and then they've gone on to do absolutely fuck all about those mistakes, I'd be a multi-millionaire. I'd be the richest guy on the bleeding planet, you know, because people just have a habit of moaning about stuff and doing absolutely nothing about it. So, you know, you have to bear that in mind. It's no good listing problems. You've got to actually do something about them. Um, so next, what's really key to us as traders routine? Um, you're going to have a pre-session game plan an active session game plan and a post session game plan. Um, my pre session game plan involves marking up all my levels, being appraised of all the areas I want to do business on a given day. I wasn't going to go through, um, you know, potential setups, but we'll go through one that I'm looking at at the moment, which is the euro against the sterling. Now, again, I've already made my plan for what I want to do tomorrow. So when the market uh, moves tomorrow, I'm not going to be sitting here thinking, shit, now what do I do? I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to know exactly what I want to do and what I don't want to do on a given day. So I'm not going to get sucked in to anything. Um, so if we have a look at the euro sterling, you can see that on the daily chart, we've got this uh, bullish engulfing that's basically occurred just ahead of this last swing low. So the prior swing low on the daily chart has been defended. We get a large range engulfing candle and very importantly it takes us not just through the prior swing high but right through this prior support level here. Very bullish day. Uh, I want to buy a pullback into support. Simple as that. So if you run a fib up from the low to the high you will see 50% fib is right in line pretty much with this prior high and this blue zone is where I'm going to buy a pullback. It may not occur tomorrow but if it does I will be long there. Um, it will be something as well that I'll be looking at in future days. What will I do tomorrow if it doesn't pull back there but it starts to push higher? Will I chase it? No because I have prior levels here that the market could run into problems at but having said that I don't want to sell these levels because we have such a bullish day so basically I don't want to chase it and buy into potential prior support levels but I don't want to sell it either there because I do think that the bulls do have the advantage here 
Um, so again, I know that really what I want to do is buy the pullback there. Otherwise, there's nothing to do for some time in Euro GBP. And obviously, you know, that's just one game plan that I've got for one market out of the 17 that I trade. But you see that I'm organized. I know what I'm doing. Believe me, I went through a period when I would get up in the morning and I'd look at my charts, I've got 17 charts, probably got out of bed late. It's, you know, getting on for the London Open. It's like five to eight. Everything's moving about all over the place. And I'm thinking, oh, how am I going to make money today? You know, and that's just absolutely terrible. Like you're never going to make money under those conditions. So have a routine. Um, it's important to be focused during the day and then have a post-session routine as well. I fill in my journal. Um, I also like to talk to myself. Um, The old joke goes, if I need expert advice, I'll just talk to myself. But I honestly do maintain dialogue with myself. If I've had a bad day, then I'm going to sit there and I'm going to think about why it went bad. There is a huge difference in sitting there and saying, oh, well, you know what? I did everything right today. I followed my plan, but I just had some bad beats. And then saying, well, actually, you know, I got up late. I missed the best trade of the day. So then I revenge traded the next move, got myself one R down. At that point, I was really pissed off. So I took a shit trade. Then I was two R down. And you see, you're trying to learn something every day. Did you trade well today, regardless of the outcome? It doesn't matter whether you were up or down. It might to your ego in the short term, but did you trade well? That's the important thing. Did you follow the process? So um, you're going to be like your own psychologist at the end of the day you're gonna have to talk to yourself nobody else is gonna help you Um, so you have to help yourself so you'll have a routine Um, now we get on to execution now I believe that there are essential tenets to doing business effectively and they can be summarized as these top three here know what you want to see know where you want to see it and know when you want to see it so the what the where and the when. Now, the what is what kind of movement do you want to see price making? It might not matter to you how price moves, but it might. You need to know this ahead of time. For example, I know that I quite like to see a sharp move into the level I'm trading. I'm quite keen to fade a sharp move. Um, What I don't want to see is the drift of death, Okay, which is that slow grinding move that a lot of newer traders associate with the market running out of steam usually when you step in front of that you get run over so I know the kind of price action that I want to see then I know where I want to see it going back to the euro GBP that I showed you just now I know that level is a key area to do business on the long side of the market so okay I'm putting two things together now I want to see price making a sharp drop right into that level know when you want to see it what is the when what time of day do you want to see it maybe you want to see it on the Frankfurt open maybe you want to see it on the London open Um, I know when I don't want to see trades set up. I don't want to see them set up in the evening. Okay, I don't want to see them set up at 7 o'clock at night when I'm not going to be watching the market. Um, I also don't want to see them set up on a Friday afternoon. Uh, A student of mine recently came to me and said they took a a trade in the Aussie dollar. I can't remember the exact time, but it must have been about 6 p.m. on Friday. I mean, who is trading at 6 p.m. on a Friday? What kind of move are you expecting then? Um, You're going to be holding it over the weekend. You're going to be taking... You know that event risk and it's as far as I'm concerned it's not a good play so you want to know those three things um, you should have a plan it goes without saying I have got a 60 page business plan um, I also have a visual plan I've gone through this visual plan many many times uh, so I'm not going to go through it now but if I zoom out you will see this graphic on the screen and this is basically an entire blueprint of my trading strategy and what it does is it takes me right through from my first look at the charts all the way through to recording the trade in my journal at the end every contingency is planned out so if I zoom in on a certain part of it for example when I'm trading a level is there space i.e. is price making a rounded retest to the level I'm trading there can only be one answer to that yes or no if it's no then I know ahead of time that I've got a pass on the trade I can't take that trade if the answer is yes then I can place the order but when it comes to placing an order stop placement is absolutely critical where do I place my stop Um, again later on here um, do I currently have any other open orders or open trades 
If the answer is no, then fine, wait for the fill. If the answer is yes, then I have to refer to the correlation table to see if I can actually trade it because obviously I don't want to take too much risk by being in correlated markets. But every step of the process is mapped out for me. I have this going on in my head, but there really isn't any room for doubt with that. That's what I'm saying. Um, I sat with a guy recently and it was five minutes before the news and he said to me, I have a great level here, but I don't know whether to trade it, you know, in case the news sends it right through my level. And he procrastinated and uh, he said to himself, actually, you know what, I'm not going to trade it. It's too dangerous to trade it through the news. Then, lo and behold, it hit the level, went absolutely parabolic on the news, right in the direction he'd anticipated. And a minute after the news, he's saying, fuck, I knew I should have taken that. I shouldn't have worried about the news. Listen. How about you work it out at a better time than five minutes before the news? People have got to get serious or you're going to be absolutely cannon fodder in these markets. You can't come in and make a decision like that a few minutes before the news. Oh, I don't know whether to trade this level or not. Um, You have to have that plan ahead of time. Either you're trading ahead of news or you're not. It's simple. Um, So, again, you'll have a plan for exactly what you want to do. Um, Again, if I prefer to the S&P 500 that I was talking about today, sod's law that I missed this because my internet was down, I've been moving house, but this was an absolutely beautiful trade and I'm not going to go through the intricacies of it on the lower time frame, but it's enough to just have a look at what this is doing on the daily. The thesis behind this trade is that we had a head and shoulders, every man and his dog had noticed this head and shoulders, everyone was expecting the market to plunge, everybody was waiting for the neckline to go, and lo and behold, the neckline went there. Um, And I actually tweeted 12 days ago, guys, I'm going to be without internet, let me know when this pattern fails. (laughs) Now naturally, that was a tongue-in-cheek tweet, but the point is, is that I've isolated the key area to spot a failure. Um, If the market participants are going to get stitched up in a big way, that is exactly where it's going to happen. So what we're waiting for is to see what price does there. You can see that price gives us an early indication that the shorts have been trapped. They've been caught initiating down through the low. We've closed back above the area. But the real icing on the cake is the follow up here, which I have gone on about so many times in webinars that I'm kind of getting sick of it now and probably you are too but right after the hammer here here is the impulse move and then there is the pullback this day here to the hammer head so you see that the market here confirms your idea that shorts have been trapped then here on the day after the impulse move it reconfirms okay that it is a good point to get in and you literally have the market by the balls at part two. BT owe me a shitload of money for missing that trade. Um, But this kind of also highlights another point, which is you always need to stay on top of things and you always need to make sure that you don't get disgruntled. Um, I start pretty much every webinar every week by saying I fucking hate the S&P 500. It's a shit market. Lo and behold, it produces one of the best trades that I've seen in a long, long time. But, you know, again, I've learned, although I don't like this market, to keep checking it, you know. Um, And again, I've seen some people that will go through little stages where things aren't working and they'll say, oh, you know, my levels aren't working at the moment and they'll maybe have a hard couple of weeks and then they start getting a little bit sloppy. They start stopping recording their trades because maybe they've had a few losers and it's now disheartening to record their trades. I know some people, you can even see it in their behavior, they start to get up a little bit late. They get up late in the mornings. You know, when they're killing it, they're getting up at half past six and doing a plan. Lo and behold, they get, you know, a losing week and now they're getting up at fucking nine o'clock. You know, so you've got to stay on top of things um, and keep pressing and especially press when you're down. That is the point to really press um, when your back's against the wall. So um, the next point here, when you know what you want to see, where you want to see it and when you want to see it, Strive to enter the market as close as possible to where you will be wrong on the trade. Um, The best example I can give you of that recently was a trade that ironically I missed by trying to enter as close as possible to where I'd be wrong. But it still goes to show you um, 
a good illustration of exactly what I mean. This was the euro dollar on a daily chart um, and you will see that there was a cracking level at this orange line okay so we had prior resistance here over here here and it's absolutely a stack of resistance in that area and what you can see is that we create this shooting star candlestick formation above that area now originally I didn't want to sell that because I was thinking that we might catch a bid at the prior highs so I was waiting to see if we could get back below them and then lo and behold if we get below them we can look to sell a return to the shooting star low knowing that that's the pattern that often happens obviously we get the impulse move away from the shooting star and anyone that's sold it from the retail pattern moves their stop to break even pukes break even on the retest and then sees it dump which is exactly what it's done here but if you come down to the 60 minute chart and you have a look after we get that impulse move away you can see we get my rounded retest now here's the daily level Here's the 38% Fib, okay, just above it. But you'll see here, this green area is the area that price often gravitates back towards, which is the last low that price made pre-breakdown. At the same time, I'm seeing that the purple line is ATR for the day, which is often a very good point to look for mean reversion. So what I can see there in a nutshell is that we have a stack of confluence in this zone here but the key to this trade is that I always want to get as tight a stop as possible and my stops generally go above thrust candles so in this case a stop would run above this candle here now I can sell it at the low and I can run a 26 pip stop or I can sell it here and I can run a 6 to 7 pip stop and there's a big, big difference when it comes to your payoff. On this trade as well, because we had news coming into this, and I think this was actually the last NFP, then I was prepared to believe that it might overstretch the lower boundary of the zone, and I would get a fill here. As it happens, I missed it. I was offered 81s, and I think we traded 78s at the high, yeah, 78 and 6 pipettes, so I missed it by under 3 pips. But the point there is I'm looking for that cheap trade. I'm isolating where I'm going to be wrong, on the trade idea and I'm trying to get in as close as possible to it to max out on my payoff and that is how I approach the market so that phrase that I make here strive to enter the market as close as possible to where you'll be wrong on the trade um, does confuse people sometimes and they wonder what I mean by it but that is what I mean and that piece of advice I was given by a huge trader a guy making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a week consistently so again, when it comes to execution, make sure you've got a plan for effectively managing trades when they move not only in your favor, but against you too. Um, it's not my place to tell everybody how to trade and how to manage their trades. It's of my belief, though, that if you're consistently taking uh, full 1R losses, that you're probably doing something wrong. And I don't know how fair I am in saying that. I know it's right for me and my strategy to say that. Maybe it's not for everyone. But what I mean by that is, if I get in the market with a 40 pip stop, um, it's quite rare for me to lose the entire 40 pips, even if the trade goes wrong. What I'm looking for as soon as I'm in the trade is signs that... I'm going to get carted and that it's going to go to my stop. So essentially, I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, well, you know, I've got a 40 pip stop. If it hits it, it's only 2% of my account. That's fine. I'm sitting there thinking I've got a 40 pip stop and I don't fucking want to see that 40 pip stop hit, you know, so I have to do something about it if it looks like it's going against me. What kind of signs might it be that the market's going against me? I might get trapped on the wrong side of a level. Um, so, you know, I might see something like this. I might buy a break and retest of a level like this and I, I come in and buy it here the market fails to hold at that level comes up retests it from uh, below makes a new low that kind of thing is going to make me run for the hills and again I've spent a lot of time journaling this and realized what situations mean that I'm going to take a full stop out so that now I can get out as quick as possible moving on to your personal approach, this is what defines you. I'll tell you guys honestly, and some of you won't believe this, but it is completely true that your edge in terms of your strategy is really not as important as how you handle yourself. 
what a lot of people don't realize is that you are the edge. They look at profitable traders and they think, show me how you trade, but they don't understand that the guy is the edge. It's not his strategy. If it was a case that the strategy was the edge in itself, why would the success rate among people's students be so low? Okay, you teach someone your edge, they would go out and make money with it. But the fact of the matter is that most people can't follow an edge. They have all these psychological issues that prevent them. And so, you know, I really do believe that you need to constantly work on yourself. And this this point here, you know, take money from anyone that hasn't put in the work you have. Make sure that there are very few people that have put in the work you have. Again, it's kind of tongue in cheek. That's my style. But at the end of the day, you get ahead by doing what other people are not prepared to do. Sometimes I see people take setups that I know have a very low probability of working. And I don't say anything because I don't want to look like a know-it-all. But I know there's a decent chance that they're going to do their ass. Okay, now let me give you an example. Take the boons today and anyone that knows my stuff, what have we got this morning here on the profile? We've got an open drive. We've got an open drive lower. Now, I held a webinar on this with you, giving you the stats. So there's no excuses for not knowing what the stats are here. But I can't expect everybody to be watching my webinars. So I'm on Twitter and I see somebody here has basically shorted the market on the retest of this low here. So they've come in and sold the retest of that low. But we know that there's an 80% probability that the market is going to go up here. That when we get an open drive, it is going to fail and that price is going to trade one tick above the open drive high. So why would you want to short it there? It's just a low probability play. Especially as that guy wasn't looking for a small move. He was looking for a continuation dump to new lows. And he was coming in there and saying, you know, on the 60 minute chart, there was a bearish engulfing. And it really looks like it's going to go. But, you know, at the end of the day, I only know that that is a low probability trade that he's taken because I have spent hours and hours and hours number crunching. It's as boring as shit, but it's not boring making money. <laughs> That's the way you've got to look at it. Just very briefly on that point, I mean, again, I keep statistics on a lot of things. Here are my statistics, for example, on the euro dollar gap. Okay, I have statistics here for every single uh, Sunday open uh, since January 2012 and the size of the gap, the direction of the gap, uh, the furthest price travelled in the direction of the gap before closing it and the R multiple. Um, and all of that is collected and put into Excel by hand. So guess what? When there's a gap in the euro dollar, I don't sit there and think, oh, what do I do now? Do I fade the gap? Do I go with it? I know what to do. And I'm not honestly trying to sit here and claim I'm a know-it-all because I don't know everything. But when I trade, I like to be as informed as possible because you're risking money here. It's not a joke. So you have to take it seriously. So moving on to risk, obviously risk is absolutely key. Um, know your per trade risk and know your per day risk. A lot of people don't have a per day risk. I think it's vital. Um, some people will argue that and say, well, you know, trade the setups that you get. Um, don't stop on a day. If you lose three trades in a row and you're down 3R, keep going. If the fourth setup is good, um, trade it. But I personally think that some days are harder than others. The market's just not conducive to what you're doing on some days. And I have a day stop. Um, and again, that's part of my edge that if I don't like the way that the market is treating me, I want to get out of the way as fast as possible. Um, there's nothing wrong with saying I can't beat the market today. What's your evolving R? I'm not going to go over this in too much detail. Uh, for the very newer traders that haven't heard of this before, a lot of educators will treat risk reward very simply and they'll say, you know, at the trade outset, you've got a 10 pip stop, you've got a 20 pip target, you're looking for a 2R uh, or two times your risk as your payoff. And that's about as far as they take it. You have to remember that risk evolves as the market moves. So if you have a 10 pip stop and a 20 pip target, you might get up, let's say, uh, 19 pips on the trade, move to break even and just leave your break even stop there. At that point, you're risking 19 to make one. Okay, a lot of people don't see that. And they come up with that 
infamous line which drives me absolutely batty, which is, oh, well, it doesn't matter, it's a free trade. It's not a free trade. <laughs> I'm sorry. And if you can't understand that, then you're probably in the wrong business because if you're up 19 pips and the market comes back and stops you out at break even, you've just lost 19 pips. There's nothing free about it. Um, allocate risk to specific strategies based on statistics. So, I mean, I have a few strategies that I trade and when something's performing well, I tend to allocate more risk to it. But this would only be really uh, prudent to different people if they're trading multiple strategies. Um, but know your maximum drawdown limits is important as well. What's the maximum that you are prepared to draw down on a strategy before knocking it on its head? Um, for me, it would be 10R. If I drew down 10R on my strategy, I would stop trading completely until I'd done a full investigation. Um, I would not be carrying on trying to dig myself out of a hole. The worst drawdown I've ever had, uh, and I've been trading since the summer of 2007 was when I got profitable, is 12R. And that was fucking nasty. Like, that really hurt. Um, but, you know, it happens. But you have to have... A contingency plan you can't bury your head in the sand and think well hopefully it won't get that bad it could get that bad and it probably will at some point so you know again you've got to prepare for it you're a trader so you've got to manage your risk um, these are the three steps to solving problems effectively which is going to be critical to your success as a trader always ask yourself what is the problem why do I have this problem how will I solve it? I produced a little graphic for this, which I tweeted a long time ago. Um, but it's key to understand that some people get really bogged down in their problems. Um, accepting you've got a problem is not always easy. It's the first step. But you have to understand that it's almost a guarantee that whatever problem you've got, other traders have faced that problem before. Uh, so you're not alone, but you have to make sure that you combat the problem, as I said earlier. The real key step which most people miss is this one. Why do I have this problem? Most people don't consider this and they go straight from what is the problem to how can I solve it? But if you don't understand why you've got it, you're never gonna manage to solve it, okay? So um, a problem that a lot of people have, I believe, is that they try to run their positions too far. Very, very common problem. I see people get in trades and maybe they're up 30 pips on the trade and they think, oh, you know what, it might come back on me here, but never mind, I'm going to run it for 200 and try and take that much out of the move. The main reason that I think a lot of people do that is down to trading a small account. But... Again, if you don't consider this second step, a lot of people might think, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that, you know, I keep trying to run everything. How can I solve it? I just won't run everything. I'll just get out very quickly at the first level. But again, think about, well, why were you trying to run everything? And a lot of the time, people are trying to run things, as I say, because of their p &L. It was a mistake I had uh, back in the day. And it comes down to perhaps having a small account. And if you're using prudent risk management on a small account, you maybe wait all day for a trade. You finally get in your trade. It jumps straight up to your next level. If you're long, let's say, and you look at your P&L and you've made $20 or what have you. And you look at that and you think, fucking hell, it's just embarrassing. It's not even worth having sat there. And you feel ridiculous. And you start thinking, maybe I should run this because, hell, if I run it to this next weekly level, that'll be $60, which is a bit more respectable. And shit, if it broke that trend line and went you know, to the next key resistance, well, that would be actually $150. And that's actually pretty good. And you see how the mind works. And you're essentially just trading your P&L. All view of the market structure has gone out the window. All you're thinking of is, well, how much money can I make? Um, so again, if you understand that you have this problem because of your low account size, you don't try and solve it by going, oh, well, I won't run everything. You maybe try and solve it by thinking, well, what I'm going to understand is that there are times to run things and there are times not to run things, but I'm going to commit to the process and, and understand that I've just got to get out at my key levels. I've got to stop thinking about what my P&L is. Um, so you can brainstorm possible solutions for every problem you've got. Choose what you perceive to be the solution most likely to work and implement it is absolutely key. And then regularly reevaluate whether you've solved it successfully. You have to make sure that you're solving your problems. You shouldn't be making mistakes multiple times or you're going to take a long, long time to get profitable. So finally, as part of your continued improvement, 
journal your trades I really do believe that is essential um, just one way in which I believe people can improve is looking at say your maximum adverse excursion when you've got your trades that become winners how far did they go against you first I know someone that massively improved their edge by just literally journaling their maximum adverse excursion on their winning trades and they'd find out let's say they've got a 50 pip stop every single trade drew down so they went into a loss on it initially before it became a winner but none of them drew down more than 20 pips well, if you know information like that, it is incredibly valuable because you realize that you can rein your stop in from 50 to 25 and it won't affect your edge at all and you've just doubled your payoff, which drastically improves your bottom line. And that's just simply by keeping stats. Um, another very good one to look at is if you're the type of trader that has targets at trade outset but manages trades actively, work out what is actually the performance when you compare active management versus doing absolutely nothing. So actively manage your trades by all means, you know, trail your stops or whatever, but record that result, then keep an extra Excel column that literally shows you what is the performance if you do nothing. I know a lot of people that would be better off doing nothing and they just tend to bury their head in the sand and you know they don't do it whether it's because they actually like managing their trades whether it's because they just you know haven't bothered to go through and convince themselves that taking a hands-off approach is the right thing to do who knows but I can see for myself some people that come in with targets uh, and talk to me about their targets and they never see that target hit they're always out too early um, think about this for a second you often hear this phrase holy grail of trading and everyone's looking for the holy grail I once asked people on Twitter what is better 8% return a month working one hour a day or 10% return a month working 10 hours a day some sad bastard actually said 10% return is better they would rather make 2% extra a month working 9 hours more per day are you kidding me I mean, get a life, man. Get a fucking life. Um, time is your most valuable asset. Why would you throw it away if you don't need to? So I'm not by all means trying to paint a picture that you can be doing absolutely fuck all all day and raking it in because I work longer hours than anyone I know. But what I'm saying is that's my edge, right? Some people might find they're better off doing nothing. If you find that you can make money putting an entry, a stop and a target and walking away, you've just found the holy grail, the way to make the most money with the least amount of time. <laughs> it's what everybody's looking for. So I do better with active management. Not drastically better, but I do do better, and that's why I've stuck to it. Um, I know a lot of people wouldn't, and I would encourage you to have a look at it. So, you know, that comes down to analyzing your performance. Um, going back to what I mentioned earlier about my stats on, say, open drives and, uh, and the euro dollar gaps, I often come up with new ideas, and, you know, when I come up with a new idea, I want to test it. So if there's a big gap in the market, and you think to yourself, what is the probability of this gap filling? You know, because a lot of people get that. They, they see a, a market situation. They don't know what to do. Should I buy this gap? Should I sell this gap? Or what have you? You're not going to know at that point in time, but jot it down. You know, jot down, well, what is the probabilities of gaps filling the same day in the DAX or whatever market you're looking at? And then when it's this weekend or when it's outside hours or when you were going to sit down and watch some shit film on Netflix, pull up Excel do some number crunching for a couple of hours because I'm telling you, you will be able to translate it into money down the line, okay? So as boring as it is, as I said before, it's not boring making money. Um, at the end of the day, one of the most important things is do more of what works and the opposite of what doesn't. If you're finding something works for you, do it. Don't mess with something that is working. But at the same time, if you're finding that something is not working for you, stop doing it and not only stop doing it, but the really clever among you will actually do the opposite. I've actually come up with some strategies over time that are literally based on doing the exact opposite of something I was doing that didn't work. Okay, um, so you want to think outside the box. Um, I remember when I was 
exploiting the brokers back in the day and I've talked about this on the interview I did with chat with traders where I was basically making free money and the way that I was doing it was just by the fact that there were these data inefficiencies and the brokers were spiking price everywhere and I was managing to hit these prices that were way out of line but you'd have say uh, the oil just trading quietly like this and suddenly it makes a hundred and fifty dollar spike to the upside I know it's a data inefficiency I sell it it drops 150 ticks three seconds later and I've just cleaned house whilst I'm doing that I have a forum that I'm reading full of people going oh my god this broker is so unfair they're spiking prices what a shit broker they're fucking scammers I'm gonna close my account with them and not trade with them and they just can't see that they're being given literally an opportunity to make free money and they're moaning about it but it's done by turning it on its head. Wow, the broker just fucked me by plowing the price 100 ticks higher on a data inefficiency. I'm going to fuck him back because that's not a realistic price. And next time he does it, I'm going to hit it, right? That's the premise. You know, you've got to try and work out a way to turn things to your advantage. Okay, That's the premise of good trading. Don't sit there um, pissed off about your problems. Turn them on their heads and make money from them. And that is really everything that I wanted to say. Has anyone got any questions? It's a bit of a rant, wasn't it? But you know, genuinely, I do see people make what I consider to be a lot of mistakes. And I feel for these people because I know, like everyone, people want to make it so desperately in this game. And they want to make it now. They don't want to go on the journey I did, which was seven years of pain and misery before I finally got profitable. But the only way that you're going to make it is by eliminating these mistakes and doing the things that most people aren't prepared to do. Quite simply, it's the only way. Um, uh, Callum, your question. Uh, when I said about keeping a percentage of your trading pot with a broker, yeah, okay, that's a really good question and it confuses people sometimes. So my risk is 2% of the total pot but I'm only going to keep 10% with the broker. So I've said this before, the, the only danger okay, of keeping just 10% with your broker is you can't do that if you want to build a record. Like say you want to build a record to impress your Twitter followers or, <laughs> or more likely as the case will be, you know, try and get in at a firm. If you want to do that, then it's not so great. And I'll tell you why, because let's say you've got 10,000 and you keep only 1,000 with your broker and 9,000 in a savings account, you're going to take 200 pounds risk, which is 2% risk. If that trade loses money, it's going to look like you've dropped 20% because the person looking at your record only sees a 200 pound loss out of a 1,000 pound account. So again, it's a bit tricky. Um, when I went into prop, I had to explain that very carefully and say, look, you know, it looks like I'm going over risk but I'm actually not. And you know, in most cases, you're probably going to have to provide proof that you've got funds elsewhere. Otherwise, anyone could say that, couldn't they? Um, but yeah, to answer your question, you're going to risk off the pot, not off what's in your account. Uh, the open drive is when the market makes a concerted move um, one way off the open. And after the first 30 minutes, the open is the high or the low. All right, ledges. So I hope you found that useful um, and I will see you next Sunday.